Well, Rabbi, it's just about 10 o'clock, and I think it's about time to uh, get going. It's very, uh, it's very exciting to have you here and to get a chance to uh, spend some time with you and have a, a discussion on a very interesting topic. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you. Oh, goodness. All right. So, well, um, I think that uh, uh, people will still be coming in and, and getting in. I think we can go ahead and maybe uh, give a little bit of introduction on to uh, what we're going to discuss today, if you'd like. Sure. Who gives the introduction? Oh, you can. You can give. You can give the introduction and and uh, on what you want to talk about. It's um, um, the topic, of course, is you know the the New Testament versus the True Testament, which is it's very profound. One of the um, statements that you said many many years ago, that I've never forgot. Once you hear it, it is impregnated into your mind. And that is the only thing true in the New Testament is not new. And the only thing that's, that's new in the New Testament is not true. Yeah, that's very much so. So I thank you for having me on. I'm, I'm really looking forward to this program. Um, let me just ask whoever is who's on, who is, doesn't need to be unmuted, mute the microphone. Um, and let's just get started. Normally, when I broadcast, I just take questions from mm -hmm. the audience. That's how I do all my shows, rather than uh, give a lecture or an introduction. But I'll, I'll do that here. Um, Christianity, unlike any other religion, makes uh, truth claims that are based completely on the Jewish scriptures it insists. The Christian Bible, the very the canonical text itself, claims that the that the church, the teachings and doctrines of Christendom, are based entirely on the Hebrew Bible, and it is in fact the fulfillment of the Jewish scriptures. Uh, Luke chapter twenty four verse forty four very explicitly says that. Just look at your own Torah, look at your prophets, look at the Psalms. In that sense, it means the writings. And Jesus is there. And we find in the Gospels where the, where the reader is challenged, says, if you have believed in Moses and read his writings, you would have believed in me. That's expressed in the Christian Bible very famously in the book of John. 2 Timothy 3, verse 16, an epistle, a pastoral epistle of Paul says that it is the scripture that is the only thing that is useful for teaching and preaching. And when 2 Timothy was written, there was no New Testament. There were no Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. What the author is referring to is the Hebrew Bible. So the, the Christian Bible is repeatedly saying that look at the Jewish scriptures, there is the truth and proof of the Christian claim. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, this is, for those who are not familiar with Paul's writings, 1 Corinthians 15 possibly is the most famous chapter in all of Paul's epistles, all of his letters. Uh, it is the resurrection uh, chapter. And, and Paul makes the claim that, number one, that Jesus was executed and was in a tomb for three days and rose on the third. And this is to fill scripture, 1 Corinthians 15, 1, 2, 3, 4. It's right there, according to the scripture. There's only a problem. There is no such scripture. It's a phantom passage. And this is what we encounter. We, when we explore superficially, this doesn't have to be, you don't have to be some fancy scholar. You don't have to um, 
be an expert. You could just, I always say to people, just look it up for yourself and just, and then you will discover that the fulfillment citations, the claims of the church are, they're not just mistaken. And that's what I used to think when I was a kid, when I was a child. I thought growing up in New York that the Christian Bible was simply making truth claims that they were just mistaken about, you know, like probably the way most of us think about Hindus and Buddhists, you know, well-meaning, but you're just making a mistake. But as it turns out, these are very deliberate um, mistranslations in, in just invention of verses that just don't exist, ripping passage, passages out of context. Um, and, um, and when you encounter that, you then realize that we're dealing with a, uh, a religion that's making uh, highly falsifiable claims. And all you have to do is just look at the Jewish Bible, look at, look at these passages uh, for yourself. But that's the basis for it. The basis for it is the, the claim of the church. It's saying we're the fulfillment of the Jewish scriptures. Well, just look it up for yourself. There's a lot at stake because if Christianity is true, everybody should follow it. And if it's not, it's idolatry and people should run from it. So anyways, that's the introduction. But I really want to open this up to questions. And, um, and I'm very much looking to hearing, uh, you know, the, the, from the audience rather than making a speech. Statement, okay. Well, I'd also like to uh, introduce Rabbi Alan Friedlander that, that came into the class that is here with us uh, today. Um, um, well, yes, uh, I, uh, um, I'll answer some questions later on, but right now it's uh, let's focus on the start of the show, um, Hashem and uh, Rabbi Tuvia Singer. Thank you, Rabbi. <laughs> So I guess if we uh, if we're ready uh, to uh, take some questions and to um, we can just uh, open up the platform to whoever has a question at this point. Good morning or good afternoon. I didn't know if I needed to raise my hand or how I needed to do it. So here, here I am. We're we're pretty we're going to be pretty informal today, you know. I'm not a uh, a professional host nor the son of a professional host, so we're just going to get through today and and have the wisdom of the Torah come out uh, by its own merit, not ours. Okay. Uh, hello, Rabbi Tovia Singer. I, I'm going to start off by saying I'm sorry, so that way you'll know who I am. Oh, you sound so Jewish. Okay. <laughs> That's so Jewish. Yeah, that's what yeah. every Jew gets up in good morning. How do you do it? I'm sorry, I apologize. What did you do? I don't know yet, but I'm sure I'm gonna be something. Yeah. That's a very Jewish thing to say. Yeah. Start off an apology. Okay, so I have a question and I I meant to ask you this when we were together in the past, but you were very busy. Do we have a record of when the New Testament organizers felt the need to glue onto the new testament the tanakh do we have a timeline did i present the question correctly you know what i'm talking about okay so i'm going to answer your question very quickly but it seems so um transparent i i, I don't think this is what you're asking but to answer your question from the get-go the claim always was from the surviving uh, first century canonical text. I mean, I'm not going to the Apostolic Fathers. I'm not going to Clement of Rome. I'm not going to the Didache. I'm going to the earliest surviving literature. The claim always was that this is a fulfillment of the Jewish scriptures and Judaism. In fact, the word Christianity doesn't even exist in the New Testament. So the claim always was that the, that the teachings of the church are in fact the natural outcome of the Jewish scriptures. Now this posed 
an enormous problem for the church. For every one of the writings of the New Testament, every contributing author, and that is, if really that's the case, what's the obvious question? And why don't the Jews believe this? Why don't the Jews, I'm talking about the vast majority of Jews, believe this? Like, why don't they go for it? I mean, here you have the very people who are waiting for the Messiah. This may come as a surprise to some folks, but the idea of a Messiah was just completely unknown to the Greco-Roman world. The idea of a Christ was, they didn't, they, they, there was just no expectation of this. So the Jews were the only people waiting for Mashiach. They're the, the only people who could read their book in its original language. As of now, the Jews always had a reputation of being a fairly clever people. Like, why don't, and we were there. They were, the Chinese weren't in the land of Israel. Who was in Eretz Israel during the first century? The Jews were, but surely not the Koreans. They weren't there. So, like, why don't the Jews then believe this if this is so straightforward and so obvious? And the Christian authors are going to, in different ways, attempt to address this, but they have to solve this. Now, the one thing that no writer in the New Testament, no church father, no reformer, no pastor of an evangelical fundamental church will ever say is, well, let me tell you why the Jews don't believe this. They, they don't believe it because they read their Bible and they just draw a different conclusion, <laughs> which is the truth. I mean, that would be the easiest answer in the world. The Jews examine their holy books, and they just draw a completely, an entirely different conclusion. That would be the, the, the right answer to give. That's what any, it doesn't have to be a religious Jew. It could be a, 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 a professor of New Testament at Princeton Theological. Okay, the, these people are not that religious. Take my word for it. Um, they would all say that, was they're very, very liberal Christians if they're Christians at all, some of them are not. Uh, we went to Harvard Divinity School, and as any professor, whatever it is, they would say that's the answer, but these are not fundamentalists. So they would, but you'll never find that in the New Testament. So how do you explain that the Jews don't believe this? And the Jews are going, you are way off. Not only that, we're willing to die rather than be a Christian. So you, you Paul, comes up with the idea, advances the notion that the Jews are miraculously blinded, that there, this is, there's an epic of the Gentiles, and there is literally a veil over the eyes of the Jews, scales over the eyes and heart of the Jew, and therefore he can't see it. He can't see the obvious. This is an idea that's going to get some traction in the New Testament. The Jews are miraculously blind. Yeah, there are a few, who, but the Jews basically, because this is the time. Of the and in fact, Paul advances the idea in Romans that, um, as it turns out, the reason why the Gentiles have been called in on this is because um, to prompt and ignite jealousy among the Jewish people. And, and therefore, the people who are just grafted into the tree, not the natural branches, um, they are going to be the one who are going to be drawn in. And then Paul maliciously misquotes. I say maliciously because it's grotesque. I mean, it's quotes Hosea chapter 2, where it says, those who are not my people will be called my people, which is a complete misquote. That means the Gentiles who are not God's people will be called God's people. It's a horrible misquote because Hosea Hosea, who lived 2,700 years ago, is referring to the 10 northern tribes, that although they are destined to doom in chapter 1 of Hosea, uh, Hosea is given children who are all named as portents to the destruction of the 10 northern tribes, the northern kingdom. So one of the children is called Lo-Ami, 
not my people. But chapter two of Hosea says, let me tell you something, at the, I'm paraphrasing, at the end of this all, those who are not my people will be called my people, which means you're coming back. At the end, the 10 tribes will be restored, as we find in Ezekiel 37, as we find in Isaiah 43, as we find in everywhere. That means eventually the Jews will return back. So Paul very deliberately misappropriates this text, okay? So this plays big in, in the Christian Bible. And then the other idea that's advanced is that the Jews are basically demonic. They're the seed of the devil, and therefore they, and you, you know, you, your father is the devil, John 8, 44. I mean, they're just evil. And they are, as portrayed and characterized in, throughout the Gospels, you're just the enemy of God and willing to uh, have God's son crucified, knowing full well that what they're up to and what they're involved in. And the Jews are just bad people. They're enemies of God. And so that's how this plays out in the New Testament. And this is why I have a, I have a, a deep compassion for, for Christians. I care about them and I don't feel resentful, but really want to reach out to them because I recognize that they have been exposed to this kind of drivel, this toxic literature. And any person who's just raised on this type of uh, characterization of the Jews as the villains of humanity. So of course, you're gonna think the most horrible thing about the Jewish people. And it's because of this is the kind of literature that fills their mind. And if that's the case, then the Christian world is not genetically defective, but rather they're, they have been um, poisoned against the Jews by this literature that's, that's so toxic, that's so meta that metastasizes so effectively that even that Christian countries that jettison the religious belief of Christianity still will retain this caricature of the Jew. For example, when Christian Russia, Tsarist Russia, abandons religion and the Orthodox Church in the revolution in the, of the early 20th century, the anti-Semitism of the Orthodox Church very much remains with the uh, Soviet Union, with the who are godless, but they, that caricature remains and metastasized. That's how powerful this is. So that's the background of, of why the church draws the conclusions they do and how they characterize the Jewish people. Does that answer your question? Excellent, excellent. More than enough. Thank you, Rabbi. All right. Does uh, does anybody else have anything that they want to add at this opportunity at this time? Um, hmm. Uh, I wonder who you might be talking to. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, you know, uh, Rabbi Singer is is one of the select few is, who has um, brought the um, defense of of uh, the. Uh, the pr problematic statements in, in the New Testament uh, into the, the norm and into the forefront. And, um, you know, uh, there's, um, you know, he's just a pioneer in that uh, and he's inspired me. And um, I also um, am a uh, purchaser of one of his books. So. Uh, but, you know, I also wanted to speak to the to the potential uh, people who would who would um, want to emulate Rabbi Singer, you know, not everyone has his knowledge base. He, he can not only explain uh, a, a pasuk in the original Hebrew using the original commentaries. He could go into the Talmud in the original language. He could go into the um, 
the sources that that founded Christianity, and he could tell you, um, and and I, I've seen him explain uh, to Christians um, the 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 history of the, of the New Testament uh, in in ways that Christians never knew. So we can't necessarily start out at Rabbi Singer's level when we begin. So let's say you want to join in the concept of you know, standing up against a missionary who, who may be uh, bothering your congregation. What do you do? Well, one of the things I did, um, you know, in a house with small children, uh, how do you keep an, a New Testament available if, if you're worried about the, the, the potential heresies involved? So what I did was I, I put it on an iPad and, and password locked it. So I, I'm able to have the, the New Testament for my personal study but the children uh, don't have access to it. Um, now, you know, again, not everyone is, may consider this because everyone maybe uh, who's watching this is used to the internet, but uh, there's a large segment, segment of the Jewish people who don't really use the internet and maybe only occasionally see a video on the internet. So if, they're, if among those people they're watching this video, this may be a workaround where they, they could uh, study the New Testament to um, answer some of the uh, falsities, but uh, still not in, endanger their, their family according to their philosophy. Okay, um, but Rabbi Singer basically answered, uh, basically if Rabbi Singer answers it, I don't expect to be able to add much to it. So but I just wanted to give that little side of it. I'll, I'll just comment on that. Hmm. If you live in, a, in an environment where your children are not gonna encounter anything Christian, just like they're, you live in an environment that they're not gonna encounter Buddhism as an example, so absolutely, why do you need to expose them to this sort of spiritual filth? Of course, of course. But we always, have to look to the Nevi'im, who are our chief rabbis. The Nevi'im were, after all, the greatest men and women that ever lived. And their teachings and their lives serve as an example for us in how to behave. That's why these holy books are written. So you always have to ask the question, what did Ishayol Hanovi, Isaiah the prophet, of blessed memory, how did he treat the problem of idolatry of his day? Did he lock away the proverbial New Testament and just not discuss the gods of his day that were seeking to poison the minds of his people? Or did he aggressively attack it? How did Eliyohan Novi how did he deal with idolatry of his day? How did, well, I think I've said enough. I think you get the point. So we find in, in Tanakh that in fact, the prophets were very happy to say, this is what the nations are worshiping. Don't go after it. And let me tell you why, because it's grotesque, because it's opposed by the teachings of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So I could tell you personally, growing up in New York, it's hard to tell from my Alabama accent, but it's true, that you know, just a superficial understanding of asking mommy, why do they have Christmas and why do they, and just being told that they worship a man as God and, and the Torah opposes this and they, believe that there that there's three persons in a godhead something doesn't sound that sophisticated and they um, and believe in the eucharist in one way or another that was very powerful for me as a youngster because i was constantly exposed to it and the gemara and sanhedrin very clearly it's not the only gemara there chazal tells in many places that it's really a good idea to know how to respond to heretics. 
However, we are warned by Chazal, don't do it unless you know what you're doing. Like, don't go to battle unless you know how to, you know, you know how to engage. And the Gemara gives us examples of people who were knowledgeable of this. But if you live in, again, if you, your kids are never going to encounter anything remotely. If they're not going to encounter Zoroastrianism, which they probably won't, then why talk about it? But if you live, if they're going to be encountering Christian stuff, I'm not saying that a person has to become an expert in the New Testament. I always say that just know your Tanakh, know the real thing, and no missionary will ever be able to touch you. But it's probably a good idea to do what Isaiah did. Isaiah spends a great deal of time attacking idolatry. And Yeshayahu had a way of being very unflattering <laughs> about <laughs> idols. He re explained how stupid it is, how dumb it is to take a, a piece of wood, chop it in half, use one part of it to warm yourself and cook with it, and the other one to carve out a god and bow to it. And describes Baal Power, which is was an idol that was used as a bathroom and describing Baal as an, as an idolatry personified by an idol that is constipated in <laughs> Isaiah 46. I know that sounds crazy, but he does. And he's mocking it. And from this comes the principles, kol etzanusa asura, bar midis that mockery in general is forbidden, but you can mock idolatry because they all did. So I would, I, I would suggest that if your children are going to encounter Christians and Christianity, probably a good idea to give them some knowledge of it so that they're just aware of it, but you know, leave it up to you. That's just an, an idea that I'd love to leave floating around. Okay. Well, Rabbi, I was uh, singer. I was going to um, see if you could expound uh, some on the, the contradiction uh, that I see that seems like between uh, Jesus and Paul, as far as the idea of Jesus saying that he came only for the lost sheep of Israel, and then this idea of Paul's evangelism to the Gentile world, you know, uh, I don't see that as being something in a, you know, as a Jewish uh, activity to go and evangelize. And why did why did Paul go into the Gentile world in the first place and try to um, uh, bring this uh, form of Judaism that he was uh, promoting into the into the Gentile world. All right. So I need to add to that some I need to add something huge to that point. Um, so it is you're quite correct that in Matthew chapter 10, verse four or five, right over there, we are told in six, just that early part of Matthew 10, uh, not we, but the disciples are told, go not into the way of the Gentiles and the city of Samaritans and you not, only go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So you, you're accurately characterizing those passages, okay? But there is another part of this. And I, one thing I definitely don't want to do is mischaracterize what the New Testament is presenting. Because Matthew doesn't end in chapter 10, Matthew ends in chapter 28, and Matthew 28 ends in the Great Commission, and that is to go to all nations and preach in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So what is being conveyed to Matthew is not go only to the Jews. You would have to put a caveat there. Prior in Matthew's view, in Matthew's, according to Matthew's Christology, um, prior to the cross, prior to 
cavalry prior to Galgotho go only to the Jews. And that's who this was message was brought for. That was the meaning of this really fancy word, but this dispensation, which means an, an economy, a spiritual economy. But at the point of the cross, in the view, not just of Matthew, but it's in the view of many books in the Christian Bible, once the, you have the other side of the cross, the veil in the temple that separated the Jew and the non-Jew was rent asunder, and now it's for everyone. That's the whole point of the cross, and that's conveyed early on in Ephesians. The veil ripping in half at during the cruc crucifixion cru at the crucifixion event, exactly when that happens, the Gospels disagree, but that's not germane. What is being conveyed is, sure, there was a veil of partition between Jew and Gentile, but not anymore. Now it's a universal, and that's where the word Catholic comes from. Now it's a, a universal a dispensation for all of mankind. It's no longer for the Jew. And, the, and this is what Paul is going to present as well, that, that in fact, this, there is a new humanity that is being introduced here. See the first two chapters of Ephesians. So, and therefore going to the Gentiles is not just something that Paul is going to express his desire to do, but in <coughs> fact, it's, it's all over the place. This idea that prior to the cross is for the Jews, but the Jews did the unimaginable. They rejected the message and they killed Jesus. They killed Christ. Now, in Christian theology, they should be thanking us for that, because if we didn't, they wouldn't have a religion. But setting that aside, uh, in Christian theology, one, after the crucifixion, it's go to everybody. Now, it's easy to understand why this would have to change. And I'll just put this as a caveat. It's very clear from the earliest surviving canonical literature of the New Testament, the letters of Paul, that essentially everybody who's becoming a Christian, not everybody, but almost everybody, they're made up of Gentiles. It means by the time we get to Paul's letters, Paul's letters that are indisputed were all written during the 50s, beginning with 1 Thessalonians, ending with, let's say, Romans would be the last. So during the 50s, we have Paul's letters that are basically <coughs> recording non-Jews. There are exceptions, but it's basically all blame. It's all non-Jews. So the Jews presumably were pretty much done with this. It's not that all the Jews, it's always Jews who are going to join any kind of group, whether it's a new age group today, or they're going to become Buddhists. They were, but that's not where the thrust was coming from. The massive conversions to this new Jesus movement, this, this Christianity, what emerges as Christianity, are non-Jews. So obviously that's where the customers are. That's where the people who are going to buy this. I mean, that's where you're going to, if you want to create a religion, you better bring this to the game because the Jews by and large want nothing to do with it. It's not that all Jews don't think. We know there were small sects of Jews called Ebionites, Nazarenes. We don't know much about them, and our only sources about them are Christian sources. Their own writings didn't, don't survive. So that's a heads up on that. So you have to look at all of Matthew, and therefore in that Christology of Matthew, uh, Paul was very much in the mainstream. It should be said, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that Paul does state numerous times that the emphasis or priority should be given to converting Jews. And he says that not in the beginning of his uh, work, but at the very end in the book of Romans chapter one, uh, verse 16, where he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power unto salvation to anyone who believes, to the Jew first and then to the Greek. So there should be always in a priority placed on the conversion of the Jew. And Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 tells people exactly how to convert Jews. And that is behave like a Jew, act like a Jew, become chameleon uh, to the Jews. I become as a Jew that I may gain the Jews. If you, those who are not Jewish, I become as someone who's not Jewish. 
I can do the whole fake missionaries that we see all over the place popping out of the woodwork in Jewish communities. They're following Paul. So, so there's a still, if you can get a Jew, that would be the best thing. But it very much is a, a, we need to convert the world and we have to go to the Gentiles with this in Matthew. Thank you for your question. All right, well, thank you, Rabbi. Um, uh, is there anybody else that, that has a question at this time or would like to uh, elaborate on what we're discussing? I'm still here, but uh, not elaborating on this uh, topic. Uh, Rabbi Singer already covered it. <laughs> All right. Well, feel free to come in and, and uh, just unmute your mic and, and ask the rabbi a question if that's if uh, y'all are ready. So go right ahead. Okay. Well, um, rabbi, I can sit there and, and uh, say that there was this uh, a couple of things that I could comment on what you were saying. And the other one is. Uh, I mean, uh, as far as uh, Matthew 28, you know, it's I've uh, that was not in some of the earlier manuscripts of the New Testament. And I, I was just wondering, you know, what your thoughts were on that. And then also um, this idea, this um, story that I've heard about how Paul had an agenda to uh, pull these uh followers of Jesus away from Judaism in order uh, because of their uh, radical uh, beliefs and, and, and uh, political uh, uprisings and stuff that they were doing. Uh, I just wondered if you were familiar with those, those type of stories that are out there about how Paul went to the Sanhedrin to get, you know, permission to go and to do this and, and uh, and then some of the other ones about the, the Great Commission not being uh, in some of the earlier texts. Hmm. All right, uh, let me address those two the very distinct questions. So the first question is um, manuscripts of the Book of Matthew is the Great Commission of Matthew twenty eight in them. So it is true that there's enormous variety in the Greek manuscripts, surviving Greek manuscripts of the New Testament. About 6,000 manuscripts survive. But it, it, it should be said that our best surviving manuscripts of the book of Matthew, in fact, the earliest surviving manuscript of the book of Matthew, of the complete book of Matthew, is fourth century. And you've got it there. Uh, you, so you could have fragments that don't have that section, uh, but in, it's in Codex, Codex Sinaiticus, Codex Vaticanus. These are, so I would say that the best manuscripts are, it appears there. Now, you should all be, your ears should all be flapping because if Matthew say is written in about 85, let's place that, Matthew 85. And we have so many variations in the book of Matthew in the, among what survives in the manuscript. There's not very much in the early centuries. I think in the second century, I'm, I can't think of a single manuscript. I'd have to look this up, I don't have it in front of me, but I don't know of a single manuscript of any part, even a fragment of Matthew in the second century. It may be, I just don't recall. You do have it in the third century. So, you know, the, the best manuscripts of all of Matthew would have it in there. And I would say that, um, now it's very possible that that was added in later and there would be good reason to edit in later because the, you had to, explain why this shouldn't just be about bringing it to the Jews as possible. I just, the evidence is not 
supported by the vast majority of manuscripts. Um, your second question is, um, oh, was Paul sent in? Was Paul essentially someone who was really didn't believe in Christianity at all, and he infiltrated the early church in order to get any Jews in the church away from it and keep it a Gentile movement. And he did this with the green light of the Jewish leadership of the time. The answer is no, that's definitely not correct. There is a very strong legend with in Jewish sources with regard to Peter. And I'm using the word legend and I'm using the word strong. I mean them both. I mean both those words. It's legendary, it means the sources are not very strong. Uh, but there is such a legend like that, that Peter was the person who was sent in to infiltrate the church early on and to get it out of the synagogue, to move it away. Because in the early years of Christianity, these people were very much in the synagogue. And how do you get them out? Because they are a, it's like an infection in, that would be very, very toxic. And then Peter, whose real name would be Shimon, Peter is a name just given to him. We are told, for example, Matthew 16, by Jesus being the rock. Um, so his name is, is Shimon. Um, he's given that instruction by no one less than Shmuel HaKotten, the same author of the 19th benediction of the Shimon Esrei, the 18 benediction. So there's a 19th edit that in fact, it will, he, he will have a place in the world to come, even though he's going to engage in this process. Perhaps that explains why Peter is portrayed in the Christian Bible as someone who's, who's making mistakes all over the place and sort of can't get his, his stuff lined up. He's portrayed as someone who's denying Jesus a number of times. He's portrayed as being a hypocrite. He's portrayed as someone who doesn't quite get it. And the question is why? Is the New Testament is kind of very schizophrenic on Peter. On the one hand, you have Peter being told that, that he is the rock because he recognizes who Jesus is in Matthew 16. And the church will give to him the keys of heaven given to him. On the other hand, the Christian Bible really goes out of its way, both the Gospels and the Book of Acts, and in Paul's letters, to say that in Yiddish, that he's a shlomazel. And we don't really find anyone else who's portrayed this way. So there's, he's portrayed as the leading apostle and the leading shlomazel in the Christian Bible. Shlomazel is a Yiddish word, which is the person who both drops the banana peel and then slips over it. So Peter is just portrayed strangely in the Christian Bible as just messing up at every turn, not getting it, not understanding that you don't have to keep kosher laws and there's a sheet coming down. And, uh, Paul accusing Peter of being a hypocrite in Antioch in Galatians 2.11, screaming at him to his face. It's very odd that Peter would be the person who's denying Jesus um, in the passion narratives in the gospel. There are some minor contradictions about when he denies and how many times he denies it. That's not important, but he does. He's portrayed that way. And why, would, why is there this schizophrenic approach to how Peter should be characterized? And, and that the Catholic Church would, would, um, would identify Peter, would assign Peter the role as the leading bishop of Rome, meaning the first pope. So the Catholic Church very much would uh, give Peter an enormous amount of a very high status 
and essentially the founder of Rome and all sorts of nonsensical legendary stories made up about his death. So why, why, why? So it's possible that there's such a schizophrenic portrayal of Peter as portrayed in both the canonical and the writings of the church fathers that it may point in that direction, but this is legendary. All right. Well, thank you. You know, you know, you hear these things and, and uh, you hear stories and things like that. And it's always good to get, get these ideas clarified and, uh, and expounded upon. So we have a little better understanding of um, this whole relationship, you know, this uh, Jew and non-Jew uh, relationship that, that had was I, that I find during that time period fascinating as is with uh, Rebbe Yehuda and Antoninus and that whole idea there of this relationship, just Jew and non-Jew relationship, you know, it's, uh, I think it's very important um, as we're, as those of us who are trying to come out and learn authentic Torah and and how it applies to us and how we how we can interact with it. So uh, these are all very good topics. I just want to make sure that anybody has any other questions right now that that they can feel free to come in and ask the rabbi at this time. Because if not, I you know I can talk to him all day long. The idea is. You know, to bring uh, to bring some of y'all's thoughts and ideas. Feel free to interject. Uh, I want to have something to say. Uh, I mean, it really covered mostly everything. Uh, it's Paul over here in San Antonio, Texas. Rabbi Singer. Yes. Uh, I just want to say, uh, me coming out of uh, the Catholic religion. Uh, I was an altar boy. I was uh, went through my first catechism and all these rituals they make you go through. And uh, I just want to say we were taught one time the, the, just to how ridiculous uh, the New Testament gets is that they brought out this manuscript from, uh, I guess, the 1600s or something. And I can't remember the name of the priest or whatever. But uh, they were talking about when they encountered the indigenous people from Mexico. And uh, apparently they were sacrificing uh, newborns for their corn would grow in the fields and, and you know, spilling the blood in the fields. And the priest approached them and told them that, you know, that JC had died for everyone's sins. The Russia, the, the righteous, the wicked, all together, and everyone's forgiven, and there was no need no more for this. And instead of the Indian shining up to his beliefs, he told him, you're just reinforcing my belief that we need to sacrifice because you're saying that this man died for everyone's sin. So it reinforces the belief that the corn will grow because we sacrifice this child in the field. So they told us this story, but it didn't even make no sense. It didn't reinforce their beliefs. It actually knocked it down. <laughs> but for some reason, they taught us this. And I just thought, it was, now that I think about it, it's so ridiculous, you know? that they promote this, that a man died for everyone's sins. When the Torah clearly says a man cannot die for another man's sin. I thought I'd just share that with you. Uh, I think the takeaway is that Christianity invented nothing and borrowed everything. The idea of ritual cannibalism, the idea of human sacrifice, of vicarious atonement, the transactional relationship between the gods and men, 
where the innocent can be slaughtered in the case of Central South America, virgins and babies, and you find that all over. The Aztecs engage in these grotesque practices. Exactly. That Christianity simply adopted these disgusting ideas. And it, it, it's shocking when you stop to think about it because in almost every country I can think of, there's a criminal justice system that at least its mandate is to find out who the people who are innocent and who are those who are guilty of a crime and to do everything possible to punish those who are guilty and exonerate those who are innocent. I, I don't know of a criminal justice in the world which doesn't attempt to find out who is responsible and punish those people. And we don't want to punish innocent people. It's not just we, whether we live in the United States or in France, all countries understand how important this is. And I think to any, any country I can think of, a, what would be most tragic is if an innocent person was accused and charged of a crime and was punished for the behavior of someone else. That's, well, that's our biggest nightmare. And that's why the, um, that is why the weight of evidence is on not the accuser, not the accused, but rather the accuser. And what we are suggesting when we encounter these teachings in the pagan world, whether it's in the among the Aztecs and Mayans and Christians, is that somehow God doesn't have the sense, the mercy, the justice that we have. I mean, like if someone is to advance that God engages in punishing innocent people, which thereby exonerates wicked people, Mark 10, 45, that means that the American uh, criminal justice system is far more merciful and more just than God. We would never apply this in our criminal justice system, never unless we were a very, very corrupt country, unless you were Stalin. Well, I think- Behave that way. So a person needs to just stop and think about what is being conveyed in Christianity and also why could, is it so attractive? And that's what's behind this. I, I think I would be remiss if I just ignored this part of it. Then why is Christianity then so attractive? And the reason is that people very frequently feel unworthy. People frequently suffer from a self-esteem that's not as robust as it should be and feel that there's nothing they can do to satisfy God and feel that God is really angry at me. And therefore, something else has to die for me. And that's the attraction. And that's what the prophets of Israel fought against at every stage. You can do it. You can repent. You can turn back. Come, let us reason together, Isaiah chapter one. Uh, Jeremiah encourages us to return to me and I'll return to you. And Isaiah says, my ways are higher than your ways. I'll forgive you. And we say that in Haftorah from Isaiah 55 every fast day. So the prophets have their hands full in fighting against the very theologies that would drive the church. They fought it. And successfully, however, many Jewish people tragically don't read Isaiah and Jeremiah, and then they're left um, to the devices of their own fears. So that's the big full story. And thank you for that question. Thank you. you. Uh, Rabbi, like yesterday uh, we had here in Waco, Texas, a citywide festival of the Day of the Dead. 
And it seems to me that uh, the the righteous Jewish aspect, the Torah aspect of Christianity is is not important, but all the pagan aspects of Christianity is 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 more um desirable within the Gentile world and, uh, you know, for us Christian, we see in Christmas and Easter and all these aspects of it. Of um, So within the church itself, it seems that uh, the paganism aspects of it is more desirable than the uh, than what Torah teachings can be gleaned from the New Testament. Do you think that um, the, the New Testament and the church is void of uh, any Torah value at all? I, I think we opened this broadcast with the statement that there are many things that are true in the New Testament. This is not only true for the New Testament, but true for the Bhagavad Gita and other so-called holy books. Anything true in any holy book isn't new, but anything new isn't true and extremely dangerous. So no doubt that uh, religions of the world have incorporated and appropriated Jewish ideas in there. I mean, we have the Code of Hammurabi that was taken from ideas that were conveyed by the people like Adam and Noah. The problem is that you have many teachings in these other religions that are toxic. And it's very un it's very hard to find a religion that has that every single thing they're saying is wrong. What makes them dangerous is that there's a little truth and then so much danger to it. And that's really what makes it so toxic. I, I am I am sure that there that people who that take heroin have some benefit from it and enjoy it thoroughly i've asked heroin addicts like what does it feel like and they describe it as something quite ecstatic and wonderful they also recognize that it will kill them and that's why they quit but there's no doubt that people who smoke cigarettes have some sort of benefit from it. It's just that the Torah is saying that these things will kill you. There's no doubt that all these religions can give the person um, inhaling the Marlboro some benefit of feeling calm. There's no doubt that there are people who have who are addicted to nicotine can't concentrate without a cigarette. I, I'm sure of it. Uh, the Torah is simply saying, I know you're getting an immediate joy out of this experience, but this will kill you. That does not mean that drinking alcohol um, has no benefit, has no kind, it does, but in excess, it'll, it'll kill you. And that's what the Torah is doing. The Torah is there to guide us to, in the right path. God gave us a Torah and then Excuse me, God, we have, there is an evil inclination, but Minosati Torah Tavlin, which is often translated as I gave the Torah as an antidote to it. But the word Tavlin, if you go into a store, supermarket in Israel and ask for Tavlin, you're going to be shown where the spices are. Torah is not there to take away the pleasures of life, but rather to spice it, to show you, to guide the flavor. You take a piece of fish or a piece of chicken and just put it in the oven with nothing. It, it probably, it, it'll be fairly flat, but if you just spice it right, you know, if you, it brings out the flavor in such a way. The Torah is there to, to spice life and to show us how to conduct our lives. But that doesn't mean that the other religions of the world have nothing attractive or the vices of the world is nothing um, that people enjoy. All right, thank you for your question. Thank you, Rabbi. And so, let's. Uh, do we want to have uh, time for one more question, or? Um, I'm sure. I'm we, sure I we do. One more question, absolutely. Okay. So, one more question from somebody that hadn't had an opportunity that has something to ask. Please uh, come forward and. 
I, I'd also like to um, follow up on what the rabbi said, if you have time. Okay, so what what um, Rabbi Singer said is, is wonderful, thank God. Baruch Hashem, he, he, um, he always answers a question wonderfully. I, I just wanted to show a different side of it as well. You know, what he said is it also applies for really any religion. Um, so what we have to understand is what's the difference between both the, the religions of Judaism and the, the ways of the B'nai Noach, the children of Noah, what's the difference between these religions and other religions? So I think it's codified in Genesis 18. I'd like to read from, here's the Art Scroll translation, uh, verses 17 through 19. And Hashem said, shall I conceal from Abraham what I do now that Abraham is surely to become a great and mighty nation and all nations of the earth shall bless themselves by him. For I have loved him because he commands his children and his household after him, that they may keep the way of Hashem, doing charity and justice, in order that Hashem may bring upon uh, Abraham that which he, has, he had spoken of him. Charity and justice. And in the uh, light unto the nations, Isaiah, uh, he starts out with the concept of tzedakah mishpat, charity and justice as well. Uh, that's in uh, verse 27 of the first chapter and onward. Uh, so uh, this, this is the, the key factor. Is there a justice and mercy and kindness in a religion or not? And if you were to do a side-by-side -side comparison between Judaism and, and the ways of the, of the B'nai Noach and any other religion but them, there's, it's not comparable. I mean, there are some religions that are, are good for an individual, so to speak, but then uh, they don't uh, emphasize charity enough. There are some things that, that emphasize charity but are unjust. So whenever, if you just look at this, um, this litmus test, this is the difference. That's why Abraham became something other than just a regular Gentile. He had an extra commandment. That's, this is the mission of the Jew, tzedakah and mishpat, and it's emphasized repeatedly in Isaiah. All right, great. Thank you, Rabbi. Well, Rabbi Tobia Singer and Rabbi Alan Friedlander, I appreciate uh, this opportunity we had to be with y'all and, and, and your discussions and your insight on anything uh, that, that we uh, asked today. So, But I would like to do one thing for myself to, to benefit to this, and that is to uh, kind of let everybody know about this book right here. It's one of the um, most important books. Someone trying to first uh, wrap their mind around it, uh, this, these subjects and this stuff like this. You know, I, I don't, uh, and a, you know, Rabbi Singer would never say anything about it, but the information in here has freed the minds of a lot of Gentiles and answered a lot of questions. So I think it's very important if y'all have the opportunity to, to get uh, a set of these books and to um, look into them, it will, I, I guarantee you, change my life. And I know uh, many, many people has changed their life. So that's my contribution uh, to this class. And I want to thank everybody for coming here and thank the rabbis for being a, a part of this and, and, and uh, guiding us as a light, uh, you know, uh, in the nations. So, uh, Rabbi uh, uh, Singer, do you have any closing thoughts or anything you would like to share with us? I, 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 we are living in an extraordinary time. And according to God's wisdom, he is using us for his purpose that his name should be raised up above every other name. We are likely living in a time where we are witnessing the unfolding of God's plan as prophesied in our holy scriptures. We're very fortunate. Be aware, I encourage you to study the holy scriptures to continue in that endeavor, that we can witness the coming of the true Mashiach quickly in our time. Thank you very much for having me on and joining you here on this uh, 
auspicious occasion. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Uh, Rabbi Freelander, is there any closing thoughts you'd you like to give? Well, it's just, it's, it's, um, it's awesome. I, I, my, uh, awesome what, what happened here today. And, um, it's a, a privilege to be, uh, uh, on the video with, with uh, one of my mentors, Rabbi Singer. <laughs> um, and, uh, I, I think a person should focus first on being pro, pro Tanakh more than anti-missionary if they want to get involved. Uh, first, read higher Tanakh, get a comprehensive knowledge. At the minimum, read Isaiah and his contemporaries that lived during the reign of King uh, Hezekiah, Hezekiah uh, which, which are um, Hosea and Micah. So read at least those three uh, prophets before you uh, try to engage. Um, and um, and uh, just uh, once you know Tanakh, uh, then you, you go through um, any other religious text of any religion. Uh, you know, you see in Tanakh, <clears throat> the prophets lived a thousand years apart, and it's all one author. They're just repeating as, like, uh, as speakers or scribes of, of God himself. But you go to any other text, they argue with each other, and uh, there's even uh, some places in the New Testament the same the same book is arguing with itself. It's it just there's so many logic errors, but we see that the uh, Tanakh, the Hebrew Scripture, is a divine document, and um, all all of the prophets and writings, uh, all of the Talmud, uh, it all points back to the Torah of Moses. And if there's any contradictions, uh, it's rejected uh, if it tries to contradict the Torah. So if, if the if the Jews do that, and, and of course God knows the Jews, and God knows the future, and God keeps his word, so why didn't he warn the Jews that he was going to change the Tanakh, and he never did, so. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, well, thank you, Rabbi, and I just want to, you know, tell everybody that, uh, you know, I apologize for, you know, my uh, hostmanship, but, uh, the tour of the value that we have today out for outweighs any of my shortcomings. I'm glad we had this opportunity. Glad that we uh, were able to speak with the rabbis. And I appreciate every one of y'all's uh, uh, thoughts and, and interactions. So with that being said, uh, we will close out today and just uh, live some of the wisdom that we've learned. All right. Shavua Tov. We're told. Thank you, Rabbi Singer. Thank you, Rabbi Freelander. Thank you, Russell. Thank Hashem. <laughs> Baruch Man. Hashem. Baruch Hashem. Okay.